Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to lecture 10 of CG0101 Structural Mechanics. I'm Arash and today we're going to talk about elastic buckling and Euler's theory. We're going to have a look at how columns buckle then we will see how we can calculate that buckling load and then we will extend that let's say theory to other column conditions. There is no problem worksheet for this lecture so it's a fairly short lecture as well today's case study is one world trade center in new york usa it opened in 2013 and it took them about seven years to construct it with a price of 3.9 billion dollars it's about 546 meter high and it has 94 floors making it the tallest tower in united states as well as one of the tallest towers in the world as we have discussed it before as well, it has some of the strongest material and some of the best structural design theories and elements used in it, making it the strongest building ever built. So, uh, for example, the concrete that has been used in it is seven times more pressure and more stronger than the normal concrete that we used as well. It is a very high tech building. Uh, and very sustainable lots of uh, building material specifically in its interior have been recycled material and um, about 80 percent of the tower's waste products are always recycled now let's get back to what we have studied before so imagine this is a slab there is a beam underneath it and then we have two columns on each side making it a total of four columns and let's say these are fixed to the ground mm -hmm. and, uh -huh. so i have a slab here i have my beams and i have my columns as we have discussed plenty of time the load that you have is always distributed and applied to the slab these loads are then carried by the beams and the beams are carried to the columns which the columns will transfer the whole load to the footing or the foundation today we're going to talk only about columns again if you remember we were saying that columns are vertical elements that they carry usually actual load and in case of columns the actual load is usually compression as you can see here as well the load is putting pressure on my column and this column will transfer a load like this which is an axial load all the way to the footing or foundation so columns compression now the cross sections that we usually use for columns are either metal and they're usually something like this so like an let's say i-beam or they are like circular even if it's metal or they can be reinforced concrete as well which looks something like this and then you can see the reinforcement coming out of it usually they have a uniform reinforcement in them or they can be a reinforced concrete circular column as well which will have reinforcement something like this yeah, so either an I-beam, usually for metal ones, or reinforced concrete, which can be square, rectangular, or circular. On the other side, depending on their height, columns can be slender and long, like this guy, and they can be short and stocky, like this guy. Now, look what happens when I apply compression to them. So I'm applying compression to this guy, and you see it really doesn't do anything. It just moves up and down. But what, are, what happens when I apply compression to a long and slender column? Look, it bends suddenly. It has a deflection, a lateral deflection in the horizontal direction. 
Is it still in elastic state? Yes, because when I remove my, let's say, loading of the finger, it goes back to its initial length and its initial state. So I haven't caused any yielding in it. It has not reached the yielding. But anyhow, imagine in your building, you're applying some load and suddenly the column goes like this. For sure you have problems and that floor might fail. But we haven't reached the yielding, which was the failure point. This phenomena, which happens in, let's say, long and slender columns, is called buckling. This sudden lateral deflection is called buckling. And it usually happens, as you can see, in long and slender columns, while in short and stocky columns, they don't care. They only fail due to the yielding. So whenever the yielding point, the yielding stress reaches, this column fails. But this column can either fail due to the yielding or it can fail due to the buckling. Now, in order to understand when this column, this long slender column fails, we can simply calculate what is the limit of the force applied. So if the limit of the force applied is, let's say, 100 kN, and I apply 120 kN, we can conclude that the column is not failing due to the yielding, but it's failing due to the buckling. So for columns, we check this to make sure that this load is not reached, this critical load which will cause buckling. This critical load is called the critical load of buckling, and today we're going to calculate and see how we can measure this critical load in order to make sure that the loads applied to my column later on are lower than that. Now, if you remember, we were saying that for any material, I can draw a stress and a strain relationship. The stress usually had, for example, a unit of force over area, and the strain was unitless because it was change of length over its initial length, while this guy was force over area. Now imagine for my steel, I have such a curve and my yielding point is here. So this is the boundary which suddenly the material goes from elastic to inelastic or plastic range. And then we were saying that the only difference is, first of all, over here, we usually have a linear relationship and we can simply calculate the elastic modulus, which was stress over strain. And it is constant throughout the whole elastic range. But the point, the moment that we pass this point of yielding, my material will behave plastically. And if I remove that force on top of it, my material will not go back to its initial position. So for short and stocky columns, usually this failure happens. That's where the, the loading is applied on a column. Let's say load P is applied. And then this column reaches its stress at yielding. So if I call this stress at yielding, this P over area becomes bigger than the allowed yielding stress. And that, that will be the failure. But for long and slender columns, before reaching to that point, somewhere, let's say around here even, or here even, you might have buckling as well. You might be lucky and buckling doesn't happen, then your, um, let's say, column will fail due to the yielding and it passing it to inelasticity and that failure. Or you might be unlucky and the, the column might buckle. So if I have a column like this and I apply a force P, which as you can see is a compressive force, so if you remember, we had either tension actual forces or we had compressive actual forces. In this case, I'm having a compressive force. Then suddenly, before reaching the yielding stress, it might buckle, something like this. And as you can see, if this was the original actual force, actual um, force applied direction, suddenly you'll see 
a movement over here. This is the buckling phenomena. It's not due to the yielding of the element. It, it just buckled. It, it suddenly has a lateral movement, a deflection on the other side. Now, I can figure out at what applied force this buckling starts. And we call that PCR, the critical load, which if I get a little bit bigger than this, buckling will happen. And if you look at the stress formula, it's probably this times area. We call this the critical load. So today we will try to figure out how to calculate this critical load. So a way to calculate this critical load is following Euler's theory. And uh, the main difference of this theory compared to the other ways that we have proven other phenomena like the elastic beam theory is that instead of concentrating on the direct stresses due to this direct load applied, we concentrate on the moment stress which is due to this buckling. So over here I have a column which has pin pin at its boat's end an actual force of compression is applied to it. It has a pin at A point and a, a pin at B point and a length of L. And suddenly, as you can see, there is a lateral deflection, which we call this buckling. So now, instead of calculating what's happening inside here in terms of stress, we look at what is happening here in terms of moment stress and we can prove how to get to the load which is the critical load of buckling. So that shows that this P applied was bigger than this limit that I had. And I have to make sure that this column will not ever reach to that point because otherwise it will buckle. In order to calculate the critical load using the Euler's theory, we have to follow some assumptions. In this case, these are the assumptions. Let's go through them one by one. First of all, the column is perfectly straight. Yeah, so you don't have any bending column. The cross section of the column is uniform throughout its length. Yeah, that means that, for example, if I have a reinforced concrete column and it looks something similar to this and I have some reinforcement in it as well, Throughout its length, these reinforcements are carrying on and the same cross-section, the same cross-sectional dimensions, let's say this is 300 millimeter in 200 millimeter, follows throughout the cross-section of my column. Length of the column is large compared to its cross-sectional dimensions, exactly like here as well. So if the cross-section has 300 millimeter in terms of depth and 200 millimeters in terms of width, the length, for example, is 3,000 millimeters, is 3 meters. Yeah? So the length compared to the cross-sectional dimensions is much, much bigger. The applied load is actual. So yes, for sure, if I have a load applied to it like this, P is actual and it's in compression. The load is applied to the centroid of the column cross-section. So if I take out this cross-section, like this, the load is applied to its centroid. Yeah, so the load is applied here. This is not always the perfect situation, but for in order to calculate the critical load using the Euler's theory, we have to assume this. And what is the problem here? Imagine the load was applied here. The problem of this is that due to this loading application, we have a distance from the load applied to the centroid of my cross section. We call that E, for example. Wasn't moment force times distance, perpendicular distance? Due to this distance that I have here, so P times E, I will generate a moment over here at the centroid as well. And this is a moment that I don't want to. And if I have an additional moment over here, that will cause so much problem in my calculations. So remember this, that the load is applied to the centroid of the column section. 
The stress in the column are within the elastic limit. For sure, we have not reached the yielding point and we have not moved to the plastic um, state. The material of the column are homogeneous and isotropic. As we mentioned, the same thing that the cross section is always the same. The material are always the same. Suddenly, I don't change to like a metal or a steel in middle of here. The failure of the column occurs due to buckling only. Yes, as we mentioned, we are not doing any yielding. The end of the columns are frictionless. The self-weight of the column itself is neglected. And the shortening of columns due to actual compression is neglected. So these are all related to imperfection. And as always, we neglect them in the general formulation of the nature.